That should be better. There we go. Good morning. Uh, special welcome to, the <coughs> to our visitors. Those of you who are joining us online, uh, glad that you've chosen to join and worship with us this morning. Um, we are ending a series of messages that I've been preaching uh, that has encompassed four weeks, but has been was split up, uh, took a week off there for renewal services. But in some ways, the messages that Darren uh, preached during renewal services or those messages, I think, kind of uh, integrated well into some of what I've been trying to communicate over the last four weeks. Um, I'm just going to offer a few reflections that may or may not be helpful for you, but um, these ideas, uh, when, I'm, when we're trying to plan sermons and messages, uh, are working around in my head for quite some time, and so I recognize that I've been sitting with this for longer than the last five weeks, um, and so for longer than you have been, and so there's a number of things in my head as I'm reflecting on where we're ending up here that might be different than where you're at, and, and maybe some of my reflections may or may not be helpful, but when, when, we, when I initially set out to preach this series of messages, um, and this, this phrase from the Gospel of John that kept coming to me, uh, the Word became flesh and, and, and dwelt among us, we've seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, full of grace and truth, and that, that full of grace and truth, and I just was wrestling with this idea of especially in just in the environment that we live in uh, or are currently living in, the tensions that we're dealing with, um, that we'll continue to deal with. Uh, I just was asking the question, what does it mean to be full of grace and truth? What does it look like to be a person that's full of grace and truth? If Jesus was, was full of grace and truth and I'm to look like him, how does that, how does that work? Is, and is it even possible because I see grace and truth kind of on this spectrum, this, this image that we have on the screen where it's, it's one or the other. And in being more graceful, I tend to maybe sacrifice some of the truth. And in being more truthful, I maybe don't come across as being gracious. And I think that's the tension a lot of us wrestle with. And so that's the tension I was dealing with. But it's not an either or, as we've discussed. It's an and. He was full of grace and truth. And so... I was coming at this more of like, what are the practical applications for my own life here on this earth? And I, I don't think there was anything wrong with that. And in, and in fact, that was kind of the message last week. And I recognize that um, as we looked at some of those, the way Jesus interacted with people last week, that, that um, we're dealing, that a lot of you are dealing with real, very real world uh, personal, like, trying to make application for that, and they're difficult situations, and so my three bullet points on the screen, while they might be helpful, like, applying this stuff is, is, is difficult, and I recognize that, um, but, it's, but the, I was coming at this from a very practical, like, what does this look like for me as I interact with people? What does it look like for Adam to be both full of grace and truth? And while well, I think that was a good starting point for me, it's not necessarily where I'm landing, where we're landing. Um, this, this morning, the focus and where we're going to land the plane is, is maybe less about uh, what this means for me practically, although that's important because how we work this out uh, is important. It, it's going to bring us to a place, I hope, of saying... Thank you, God. And I'll just kind of give you the conclusion now at the beginning. But Jesus, in his, in his fullness, in the fullness of grace and truth that he walked on this earth and how he lived that out, the whole purpose behind that was not just for himself, to make himself look better or, or whatever. And maybe that was some of my own heart check behind this. But it's the whole purpose behind it and the emphasis that John places on this throughout his gospel is for the glory of God to be revealed, for the glory of God to be revealed. And that's the piece to me that, is, that, I'm, that I'm landing on now that I maybe wasn't expecting, is more than just how do I work this out just so maybe that I can be a better Christian, which is good because the, better, the, the more Christ-like we live in this world, the more we reflect his glory, and that's where we're ending up. But this, this morning, where we want to land is that all of this is really so that the glory of God is revealed 
on this earth. And I think that's, that's what Jesus did, and it was, it was his purpose, and it was his, de- his desire. And so that's hopefully where we'll end up landing this morning. Um, someone once told me that in communicating, uh, and I don't, uh, yeah, in communicating that to be a, an effective communicator, you, you need to do three things. You need to tell people uh, what you're going to be saying, then you need to say it, and then you need to tell them what you've said. And so this morning, this is the what I've said part over the last four weeks. We're just going to kind of walk through what I've been saying, and then again, add kind of unpack sort of the conclusion that I've already teased for us here. But we began in John chapter 1 and verse 14 with this verse, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. And we were kind of asking some of these questions that I've already said. What does it mean to live like this? What, is it even possible? Um, and we learn a few things in this passage and, in, and even really throughout Jesus' life uh, about who God is. As we look at Jesus, we, we learn how he thinks. Um, we learn who, uh, how we are to be and who we're to become in the life of Jesus. And then ultimately, uh, we look at the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross, and that's where we're going to kind of end up tonight but, or this morning. And so, in all of this, we're wanting to become more like Christ and in his purpose and in, in displaying the glory of God. And so we talked about, first of all, what is grace? Well, grace is God's undeserved, unmerited favor. It refers to the freedom of salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. And this is how Paul uses it primarily. We're reading through Paul's letters in the New Testament. Paul underscores the fact that salvation is freely given by God to undeserving sinners. And then we have to recognize that we need grace, that we are those undeserving sinners in need of this unmerited favor of God, this free gift of God. And he offers it to us so that we can become his children. As John said in a few verses prior to verse 14, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but of God. And so we recognize that we are not naturally born his children, and this free gift of grace is offered to us, and as we receive it and we believe in it, we become his children. And kind of the conclusion then that we came to in this discussion on grace is this idea. Again, the, the main gist of John's gospel is that the glory of God is being revealed in these attributes. And so because we've received grace, if you've made that decision, we've received grace upon grace, that's how John words it, we've seen the glory of God. If you've received God's grace in this place this morning, or within the sound of my voice, you've seen the glory of God. And so how are we going to now respond to that? What are we going to do with that glory that we've seen? How does that change and transform us? And then we moved into this question of what is truth? And we, we looked at a, in an interaction that Jesus had with Pilate. And I'm just going to read it for us, just a couple verses. It goes back to John chapter 18, verse 37 and 38. This is Jesus when he's on trial. And Pilate is asks him this question, or makes this statement, you are a king then, speaking to Jesus. And this is Jesus' response. You say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And then Pilate responds with this question, what is truth? What is truth? And, and that's a question that we all kind of wrestle with, I think, at times. And so... The implications and we, we discussed from this interaction that Jesus has with Pilate are threefold. First, that there is a truth. We understand that there is such thing as absolute truth. And we talked about how um, the opposite of absolute truth would be relative truth. This is, and relative truth would say that there's a truth for me, there's a truth for you. And you dictate what that is. Um, and I can't impose on you the truth that I believe, and you don't, as long as you don't impose on me the truth that you believe. And th- but what we learn in Jesus' statement is that that is not the case, that there is, in fact, a truth. That Jesus didn't say that I came to bear witness to a truth. He came to bear witness to the truth, and that truth is in him and demonstrated in him. And, and the, 
the absoluteness of that then is that this truth is rooted in something that is beyond ourselves, outside of this world. And so this world does not influence the truth. I don't influence the truth. It's in, it's in the person of Jesus. It's in God the Father. And so we don't have any, any influence over that. Secondly, then, we learn that Jesus is the key witness. If we want to know what this truth is and how to live it, we look at Jesus' life. He bore witness to this truth. And then thirdly, um, this kind of command uh, to not be like Pilate. And in saying that, we're, what we're saying is that Pilate was kind of riding the fence. He wasn't going to commit to one side or the other. He wasn't going to say that, yeah, um, I don't believe the truth is absolute, but he also wasn't going to say that I believe the truth is relative. He's simply saying, I don't know. It could be either or. And the, the challenge and the check for us in our self-evaluation then is, how much are we like Pilate? We don't want to be like Pilate. Are we like him? Um, and I think for myself, as I examine my, my life and how I've interacted in certain situations, that I've maybe been more like Pilate than I'd like to admit, where I... To avoid confrontation, to, to avoid stirring things up, I might just err on the side of saying, you know what, I don't know. And I'm just going to hide my true convictions when I really do know that truth is absolute. And so we play this kind of I don't know card. And the reality is, as we talk, that when our, when our personal lives, our personal property, those types of things, our person is involved the I don't know is it, it really flies out the window. We talked about being punched in the face. As soon as you're punched in the face, we, we begin to believe that there is some kind of moral order, that that isn't right, and that, doesn't, that exists outside of us. And so when our personal lives and our personal property are at stake, we tend to start to believe more so that there are absolutes and that there is some source of morality. And that ultimately then, if you could advance me, Eric, um, it brings us to this place that uh, the truth sets us free. And this is how uh, we, know the tr- we know the truth in the person of Jesus Christ, and the truth sets us free. And so we began to look how grace and truth um, sort of work together, that the truth brings about the knowledge and understanding of this gift of grace, and then there's freedom in that. And then last week, we, I asked a question, we asked a question, how, so how does Jesus do it? And this is the personal uh, kind of, I would say, practical application for our lives. And again, I recognize that we're dealing with, it, when overlaying this with our real world situations, that it's still difficult. The application is still very difficult. And we deal with, um, yeah, in, in just living in this world. But here were, were three s- stories, instances, where Jesus was interacting with people um, that we looked at that felt like could illustrate for us what it might look like to be a people that live full of grace and truth and how Jesus did it. We looked how, how, at his interaction with the Samaritan woman at the well. A number of things there that Jesus, as a Jew, wouldn't have, shouldn't have, wouldn't have even been interacting with a Samaritan woman. And so there's kind of, that's kind of an aside, the fact that we kind of need to even get outside of our comfort zones and interact with people that would be perceived or we might think of as enemies and begin to have these kind of conversations. Um, but he unpacks for this woman at the well uh, what I initially I see as a, this offering of grace in the form of living water. And then he goes on to reveal truth to her about who she is and her situation with her number of husbands. And it brings not just her, but that community to this place of saying, yes, you are, you are who you say you are. You are Jesus. You're the Messiah. We, we believe. And so a whole community is transformed by that interaction. And then we looked at Jesus' healing of a lame man by the pool. And again, Jesus asked this man who's been an invalid for many years, uh, do you want to get well? Offering him, him the gift of healing prior to any other requirement being done. And then he heals him. But the man comes back to Jesus and he speaks. And, and in this interaction, Jesus tells him, now go and leave your life of sin. Or stop sinning or something worse may happen to you in this particular instance. But there's this this call to stop sinning. Recognize the gift that I've gave you, the healing that I've given you. Now turn and change your life. That, that the grace of God and combined with this truth of who he is kind of leads us to repentance. Um, 
brings conviction on us. And then finally, in a similar vein, uh, in, in Mark's, uh, or in, still in John's Gospel, uh, chapter 8, I believe, Jesus forgives an adulterous woman. Here we have Jesus and the, the religious leaders catch this woman in adultery, and they bring her before Jesus, and they throw her down there and say, well, essentially, to test him, what are you going to do with this woman who's been caught in sin? And Jesus makes this statement that we're probably familiar with, he who has no sin be the first to cast the stone. And eventually everyone leaves. And, and Jesus says to this woman, where are your accusers? And there's none there. And he makes the statement, Jesus makes a statement, that neither do I condemn you. And again, the same uh, I, offering of grace, but then followed up with this, go and leave your life of sin. Turn from what you've been doing. Uh, receive the free gifts I've been given you. And so in summarizing all of that, I came to, we came to these three points, that Jesus in demonstrating the fullness of his grace and his truth, uh, and likewise then who God is, he leads with grace. He offers that gift prior to any type of requirement on the part of the individual. He reveals truth, and which kind of brings us to this place of repentance, and he withholds condemnation. We talked about how Jesus did not come to condemn the world. John, we're familiar with John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should have eternal life. And then 17 says that he, he did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. His purpose was to save us, not to condemn us. Now, his grace and his truth lead us to conviction, which is different than condemnation, and I had some conversation with people about that, but, to repentance, but he withholds condemnation. But that's not to say that there isn't a judge. And he, Jesus makes that statement that we looked at, that there is a judge. And it's his Father in heaven who judges. And he's the one that will, will do the final judging. Um, and Jesus even recognizes that. And I think that's important for us to recognize. And so that brings us then uh, here to this place this morning. So what really does this all mean for us? What does this mean for us? Um, well, I think it means a couple of things, and I'm going to borrow some things from John Piper here this morning that were helpful for me, and I'm packing this, and hopefully it will be helpful for us. Um, what does it mean for us that the Word became flesh? We're going to take this kind of all together, that the Word became flesh, that Jesus took on human flesh and bones and walked on this earth and dwelt among us, and he did so in this way, in this fullness of grace and truth and revealing the glory of God. Well, it means for us that Jesus, in Jesus Christ we can see the glory of God. That's what we've been talking about. We can see the glory of God in Jesus Christ. In really any of his interactions, we picked out three, but I think it would be safe to say that as we go through the Gospels and we look at Jesus' life, that really in any of his interactions, what we're seeing is something of the glory of God. And what we, we can learn is something of who God is. And so we can overlay that onto anything. Um, in this particular case, we were, I was, we were trying to look more for the grace and truth working together elements. But the glory of God is revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. Secondly, then, that the glory of God revealed in Jesus does not consume us in our sins. And that's good news for us. That the glory of God revealed in Jesus Christ doesn't consume us in our sins. This is kind of the leading with grace part. We're not immediately consumed by the glory of God. Because rightly, we should be. By all rights, the, the glory of God is so great that we, in our sinful state, should be consumed by it. But, thanks be to God, that the glory of God is full of grace and truth. And then the, the glory of God in Christ is His gracious disposition to us without compromising His truthfulness. His gracious disposition to us without compromising His truthfulness. That is to say that He, as I summarize it, leads with grace. But in leading with grace, He does not compromise His truthfulness. Again, this is good news for us because Jesus could have come not full of grace and truth, but as a judge, as, a, as an executioner. And He would have had right to do so, but He didn't. It's not how he's described as coming in. It's good news for us. And we'll piggyback off of this, again, continuing with this idea of what it means for us that he is gracious in his disposition towards us, but in being gracious to us, he does not compromise his truthfulness. The glory of God was revealed in Christ 
through his death because he is full of grace and truth. And my typing's getting too small. Saying that God is true to himself because sin was punished. And this is the truth, the truth part of who he is. He does, in his graciousness to us, he doesn't compromise his truthfulness because sin does ultimately end up being uh, the price for sin is paid. And it's paid by Jesus. And this is where it's important for us to understand uh, the whole of this verse that the Word became flesh. It's why Jesus had to take on flesh and, flesh and blood. And this is what Hebrews 2, 14 through 15 says. Since the, children, since the children have flesh and blood, He too shared in their humanity, so that by His death He might break the power of Him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who, are, who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. The reason that the Word became flesh is because we're flesh. And that the punishment for sin had to be bore out, had to be yeah, born, put upon, whatever the correct word is there, uh, on someone who was flesh and bone. And that became and that was Jesus. Jesus did that for us. And so he was gracious in his disposition to us, but he didn't leave sin unpunished. He became flesh to pay the price for our sins. And so God is gracious to us because Christ bore the punishment, uh, not us. He's, he's true to his character in that sin was punished, but he's also gracious to us because Christ bore the punishment and not us. And so just kind of in a few closing thoughts here, I'm going to add one other element to this for kind of what it means for us going forward and this sort of adjoining to the practical application of how we work this out, the purpose for it. Why is it that we desire, that we should desire, that we should live out the fullness of grace and truth? It's for the glory of God, and this is where we're going to kind of land. And to do this, uh, I'm going to bring in Paul here. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4 says this, the God of this age, that is Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. You might want to turn in your Bibles just to read that because it might be more helpful to see it. I'm sorry, I don't have it on the screen. This is Paul's way of saying what John says in John 1, 14. Again, here's how Paul says it. Satan doesn't want us to, to understand this. To see this. He's blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Paul's saying the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. That's John's way of saying the glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Paul and John are, are kind of saying the same thing here. There's this light that is revealed in the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. It's, it's a glory that we, we see spiritually, that we, as we read through the Gospels, it's this good news. The light, again, going back to Paul's terminology, the light of the Gospel, or we substitute in here good news for Gospel, because that's what Gospel is. It's the good news. The light of the good news that displays the glory of Christ. And Satan doesn't want us to see this, and so he blinds our eyes to it. And John Piper describes it this way, and I think his words are just fitting, so I'm going to quote him here. In talking about this spiritual blindness and how it is that we come to see the glory of God. You don't have to see Him physically. You meet Him in the Gospel of John and the other writings of the Bible, speaking about Jesus here. And when you meet Him through these inspired stories of His words and deeds, His glory shines through. The self-authenticating beauty of that matchless mixture of grace and truth. Let me read that for you again. Speaking of Jesus here, you don't have to see him physically. You meet him in the Gospel of John and the other writings of the Bible. And when you meet him through these inspired stories of his words and deeds, his glory shines through. The self-authenticating beauty of that matchless mixture of grace and truth. I think that perfectly summarizes what, in essence, I've been trying to communicate and maybe hopefully have. 
that as we read through the Gospels, as we read through all of Scripture, really, not just John's Gospel, not just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Paul's letters, we see the glory of God shining through. That's where we meet Him at. That's how we meet Him. None of us have, I will say, so to speak, have seen Him face to face like they did then. We haven't walked with Him personally then. We didn't see Him die on the cross in person. But we meet Him there, and we see Him there in the stories that have been written. And that's where we find Him. And then it's authenticated then for us this matchless mixture of grace and truth that reveals the glory that shines through. But the devil tries to keep us blinded to this light, to this good news. Because that light brings us life. And if we go back again, staying in John chapter 1, you go back to verse 4. John says this, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light of Jesus Christ in the good news brings us life. And Satan doesn't want us to have that life. He wants so he keeps us blinded to this light. But when we have a uh, new spiritual life, this new light happens in us. And it's not a physical light, it's a spiritual light. And the spiritual brightness of the glory of God and the glory of the Father begins to shine in us. The reason Satan blinds us to us blinds us to this light is because he doesn't want us to behold the glory of God. One thing that I've always believed, I still believe, will continue to believe, even as I stepped into this role as a pastor, was that in, in preaching, uh, really in any context, whether it's teaching, preaching, interacting, is that I believe that we can't have a true encounter with Jesus Christ or with God the Father and walk away unchanged. That we can't behold the glory of God and leave unchanged. That truly behold His glory and not be changed by it. And I think Satan recognizes that too. And so if he blinds us to the light of it, then we can't behold the glory that will change us, that will give us life. So kind of, again, trying to bring this all together. John, back to John's Gospel, verse 12. I'm going to read 12 through 14 all together because the section all fits together. It describes for us the transformation process and brings us really to the conclusion that I want to land on. Here's the transformation process, beginning in verse 12 of John chapter 1. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. How is it that we come to this transformation? It's because the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We've seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. And so I'll, I'll end this way, saying kind of with this exhortation, behold the light. I pray that we, we have, that we will see the light. And in seeing the light that we behold the glory of God, the glory of our Father, the glory that was revealed in His Son. And to dovetail this in with Darren's messages, that that fullness that was in Jesus Christ dwells now in us. And so we can live this way, or we should be living this way, that the glory of God is revealed in us through our interactions, through the fullness of His grace and His truth that we display. All for the glory of God. In the spirit of thanksgiving, it, I ended in this place with, with thankfulness. And three kind of statements of thanks, and we'll just land this way. Thank God that the Word became flesh. Thank God that His glory is full of grace and truth. And thank God that its fullness shone most brightly for us at the cross. Let's pray. Father God, as we kind of land here this morning, I just end on this note of thankfulness. Thank you that you took on flesh and bone, that you dwelt among us to pay 
the price for sin that we should be paying. Thank you that your grace, that your, your glory is full of grace and truth. That your graciousness is demonstrated in, in the fact that we didn't have to pay the price for sin. But your truthfulness is upheld in that sin was paid for. And it was paid for by your son. By Jesus on the cross. Thank you that the culmination of your glory, that the fullness of grace and truth are found at the foot of the cross. And so, God, may we find ourselves there this morning as well. May our eyes be opened. If we have been blinded by the devil uh, from the light of your glory, may our eyes be opened to see and to behold you and to be changed. To be made like you and may in being transformed by you that we can be then the revelation of your glory to the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.